share uh, his presentation. So I'll just introduce uh, Dr. B.J. Rajesh. He's a consultant neurosurgeon in Ashoda Hospital and also General Sec Secretary Ashoda Academy of Neurosciences. Uh, he has a postdoctoral fellowship in neurovascular surgery and worked as assistant professor in Sri Chitra Institute before. He, had, uh, he has authored several papers and his interests include skull base surgery, functional neurosurgery, IONM, and also artificial intelligence projects in neurosurgery. A warm wel welcome to you, sir. Please take it off. Thanks, Chaitanya. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, Nitin, that was a wonderful and exhaustive uh, talk. Uh, though it looks exhaustive, uh, but it's the basics in monitoring. I think most of you, uh, there is absolute, uh, most of you should have got an overview of what kind of intro monitoring is available and what things are being done. Uh, though it looks exhaustive, it's actually basics. Now, what I understand from this meeting down when I was looking at all the charts, most of them are from NS3. I'm not sure how many. Uh, surgeons are there. Uh, uh, I'm trying to give a brief talk on uh, from the surgeon's perspective. Probably now uh, uh, in this COVIDian holidays, we are uh, bounded, we are uh, almost bombarded with all webinars. So some of you must have got sick of these webinars, but this, uh, I'm going to keep it brief and probably interesting and I'll be talking mainly from surgeon's perspective. So as uh, so when we, as a surgeon, when we sit in an OPD, we get patients who come to us with tumors and I'm specifically talking in, uh, with regards to tumors or any, say any surgical problem, when they come to OPD, the responses from the patient and relatives have been changing for uh, past maybe say 50, 20 years, the responses are different. The olden days, the response used to be that, okay, you just give us the patient safely and we're happy if patient survives. Then subsequently, they started asking, why don't you remove tumor totally? And then we have been seeing in conference everywhere that most of the, Surgeons keep presenting pre and post and total removals and that kind of stuff. Now, off late, we keep hearing, uh, please remove totally and uh, I want the patient safe. Now, there's a very, very important statement which comes from them where they are talking about uh, concepts of function of the patient. And that is where the monitoring really comes into picture. So as we know, for the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. And uh, probably for many of us, uh, or at least some of us might think that the best way is not to operate. But as a surgeon, you cannot do that. You have to operate. And uh, we are crazy for operating uh, on patients, try to give them best results. And in order to achieve that, we need a lot of exposure. See, the previous days, uh, the number of surgeons are less and there are many uh, more patients and many, very few hospitals and all. The surgeons had a lot of experience and they learn from the experience and they do wonders. But now we have many doctors who are, uh, and many, though there are many centers, but a lot many residents in each center and the kind of exposure, surgical exposure, what we get is significantly low. So we need to depend on other tools. And uh, fortunately, as the technology is evolving, we have a lot of tools which is assist us. And uh, monitoring definitely will help in uh, uh, subserving this hypocritical growth of first doing no harm. Now, uh, if we see the evolution of surgery, way back, it was only uh, like a biopsy, then subtotal decompression, then coming to maximal resection, then maximal safe resection. So nowadays, we, there's a transition from maximal resection to maximal safe resection. So during the era of maximal resection, the functional aspect was not given much importance. And uh, if we look back on a training period, we are taught about all the aspects of uh, surgery with regards to the anatomical concept, which is directed towards uh, total resections. We are trained with uh, different kind of armamentarium, 
like microscopes, endoscopes, drills, QSA, all those things help us in technical. I mean, they help us in trying to remove the tumor and all, but uh, we don't, uh, we are not trained much about the function of the brain, the real time function of the brain. Probably we'll read and we will not give much importance of the function of the brain. Even during our MBBS days, uh, uh, we have anatomy and physiology. Many of us, uh, we always keep talking that surgeon is anatomy and anatomy surgeon. But that was probably a decade or few decades back. Now we need to know the function as well, the physiology as well of the brain. And that too, physiology live. We have, of course, some technology where uh, like ICG or say functional MRI, which talks about function of the brain, but uh, they're still not uh, real time. The only real time functional assessment can be done with uh, monitoring and without that, the MSR or maximal safe position is not possible. So with this thought process from the patients and the surgeons, a lot of evolution has happened, especially in in the technology side, which will assess the surgeon. I mean, look back over the last 50 years, a lot of innovations happen in neurosurgery. Significant amount contributes is contributed by the drugs, but leaving that, the most important thing is image guidance devices. That is uh, max where a lot of research is done and every year still a lot of devices coming up. Next was interop monitoring where we could almost 21% was the kind of innovations happen. The neuromodulation devices, endoscopes and microscopes. Now we see that uh, though interop monitoring devices are significantly improved, but uh, not many of us are trained and not many of us are using it. The reason why, as I told you, is that uh, probably it is because of uh, we are not trained in monitoring uh, 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 during our training period. Even you know, during my state Chitra in my training period, we didn't have much of intro monitoring uh, during the training period. Subsequently, I had a tough time in implementing that. Though intro monitoring was uh, is probably 100 years old where it started off with pen field and trying to monitor for epilepsy and even uh, epilepsy was one where it is routinely being used and even for uh, movement disorder surgeries, it's routinely being used, but this never translated into uh, routine neurosurgery, basically because we didn't uh, understand much about the function of the neural tissue and we didn't give much importance to that. But off late now, because the concept of maximum safe recessions, we are trying to look in that aspect. And look at the publications as well. You see that uh, uh, last 25 years, the publications uh, there is definitely an increase in publications with regard to preoperative pre-surgical planning or intraoperative assessment, whereas the neurophysiological monitoring is far less. Again, the basic reason is uh, we are not really trained in monitoring and we don't give much importance. Multiple factors, probably you, a surgeon cannot do, you need a good neurophysiologist, you need good technicians or anesthetists who really work behind that. Only when this entire team was the uh, monitoring part uh, will improve. But off late, we are seeing that a lot of public is coming up. Now, there are a lot many things which uh, uh, INM teaches us. And this is what I'm going to briefly uh, talk about uh, and what all things it teaches us. Just to summarize and make uh, you understand, I'm uh, being as a surgeon, uh, uh, listening to all the top, uh, everything what Dr. Nitin has spoken about, uh, nothing much goes into our mind. This is basically to summarize for a surgeon's perspective is, intro model is very simple. It is stimulate and see the response. And seeing responses can be in waveform or functional assessment, like in a way where you do a functional assessment. And this you need to analyze. It's as simple as this. It is not a complicated thing, very, very simple thing. As you keep doing it, you realize that it's very simple. And there are certain basic principles which you should know is that uh, 
there is a rule in functional neurosurgery that one milliampere current will tell us one millimeter distance. Now, based on this guideline, this will help us in telling how far we are from the normal structures while you're operating. The other basic principle is that uh, you can label something functional, not just with one stimulation, it's three non-consecutive stim stimulations you have to do before you can label some structures functional. So this goes to say that you need to dedicate some time for that. And uh, so uh, again, summarizing you, as what Nitin has told us, to broadly summarize it is you map and then monitor. I mean, without my mapping, you're doing monitor, again, it's not good. You need to map and then uh, monitor. So what do you map and monitor is basically gray matter and white matter, functional areas, and also non-functional areas, like uh, say, trying to get a, a central sulcus, that is a, probably a non-functional area which you're mapping. So in general, you think you map only the functional areas, but non-functional area also you can map because in some uh, tumors, the anatomy gets distorted. And most of this mapping and monitoring can be done under general anesthesia. Probably speech is the only thing where you, I mean, you do not require, I mean, you should do under awake. So these things has already been told by Nitin. So I'm going to talk about, uh, highlight the, uh, the problems what you face as a surgeon and then what lessons you're going to learn. So when initial, uh, cases when you start uh, doing uh, um, uh, intro monitoring, uh, the anesthetist, the technicians, and while trying to put the monitoring uh, monitors all over the body with needles and then connecting and all those things. And from the other side of the screen, you start operating. So already you feel that you have lost a lot of time when the anesthetists and technicians are taking before surgery. If that had not been there, I would have finished my craniotomy. That will be the first perception. The next perception is after doing craniotomy and then when you uh, uh, go towards the uh, functional area where you start stimulating, you put your stimulator, whatever it is, and then you ask the anesthetist or technician to pass the current. And then you wait for the response. Now waiting for the response is initially, because in a center when it is not uh, streamlined initially, there are a lot of problems. There'll, you need to wait uh, for some time before you get a response from your anesthetist. There are multiple reasons for it. Probably you're not, uh, your contact is not good, the area is not irrigated, probably BP is low, probably the temperature is low, there are a lot of connections in OT, the electrical interference. The anesthetists or the technology really need to understand the waveforms and then interpret from that. So these are all the things which we, uh, anesthetists from the other side will be looking at before he can tell the surgeon that yes, I'm getting or I'm not getting. Or is there any change in the waveform which is significant enough? They may see a change in the waveform. Say 50% might be the criteria. But if it's reaching 40%, they will think, should I tell or not? Now, informing the surgeon, we need to alter the, whenever there is a change, we need to alter. So is it right if I inform when there is an early dip in the uh, responses? So a lot of things keep happening in SS and technologists mind on the other side. So they take time. So this definitely teaches us to learn patience when you're, uh, doing surgeries and it is utmost to, it is of utmost importance especially for neurosurgery. Now seizures, seizures is another thing which uh, we are all worried about, especially in awake surgeries. I have seen in many centers where uh, many places where once the seizure happens, suboptimal treatment might be done because of the fear that whenever seizure happens, uh, there is uh, we are worried about. Uh, it's a brain bulge, patient might aspirate, patient there may be delay in recovery there. Because of brain bulge, the normal plane might be lost, there can be bleeding, the patient may be not become cooperative. A lot of things keep happening in surgeon's mind. And uh, for that reason, if you try to, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, 
uh, stop surgery or do minimum and come out, that is suboptimal treatment. And that is not necessary. Very rarely you get multiple seizures during surgery. So you should not be worried about that. There are various strategies to prevent seizures. Of course, uh, uh, many of us do is uh, we already load them with antiepileptic and in seizure-prone patients, you give an extra dose of antiepileptic. But uh, before you start surgery in such patient, the most important thing what you need to keep is make uh, tell your staff to keep a cold saline ready as soon as the cranium is over and it should be lying on the trolley next to the next to you so that whenever a seizure happens the cold irrigation is the best thing to prevent it from becoming a status epilepticus or preventing or immediately halting it now that's the most important thing the, the other important thing what you should know is whenever you're trying to stimulate so practically what happens is when you try to stimulate in an area uh, you uh, you're not sure how much far away the functional area is and you start stimulating with uh, say bipolar you slowly keep increasing the current now safely you can increase the current 8 milliampers 12 milliampers and some centers are 2 to 20 milliampers as you keep increasing you're not getting any response so or you may not be getting the functional area like uh, before you put an incision water and identify the motor strip and you're trying to do it and you're not getting it. And the area of exposure is minimal and uh, you're not sure how far is the functional area. And uh, so there will be at times a tendency where you take out the bipolar stimulator and you put a monopolar stimulator. Now when you change this, many a times it can happen that you tend to for the technologists there may tend to forget to reduce the current and they give it the same current. And that is the reason why they can suddenly throw a seizure because suddenly a high current uh, spreading in the brain can cause a seizure. So that is to so prevent it, always go from lower currents and uh, keep increasing the current slowly. That is one of the most important thing which you should remember. And uh, uh, the uh, I think that uh, is one of the things where uh, you have two different kinds of techniques when uh, you try to do a stimulation, what is called a penfield technique, which is nowadays most of us don't follow it. That is a continuous stimulation, little high current, and those are the patients when you use that kind of technique, uh, the seizure instance is very high, almost up to 24%. But uh, when you use the simple short uh, uh, trained intermittent uh, direct cortical stimulation, the instance is less than 0.7 or maybe uh, up to a 4%. It's not more than that. So these are some of the techniques. And uh, the other thing as uh, Dr. Nitin has emphasized is uh, trying to recall from surrounding areas by EEG or maybe uh, strip electrodes to be placed around the possible, uh, around the area of exposure underneath the dura. Whenever a seizure happens, usually it tends to spread out. So when you try to stimulate and if you get a recording from far away underneath the dura, it's called as after discharge. And when these discharges are high at particular current, say if you slowly increase from one milliampere to two milliampere, three, four, and five, at particular uh, point, you get this, uh, uh, discharges from the surrounding uh, area that is called as an after discharge. So the after discharge is guide where it will tell us in this particular patient we should never go current above that level. So these kind of precautions you need to take to prevent a seizure happening in your patients. Then uh, what does it teach? It also teaches us to be gentle. Like in this particular figure, you can see there's a lot of subpile bleeding. Uh, I do not say it's because of rough handling, but you know, whenever there's a tumor, it is always fragile and even a simple touch with any kind of instrument, it can cause uh, bleeding. And subpile bleeding, as we know, is not good. On the tumor, fine, you may research that part, but surrounding area of subpile bleeding happens and it spreads. That will be a focus of uh, seizure, in fact. So it always... It also teaches us to be gentle. Deficits, a decision making. So deficits during surgery, when you're trying to remove tumors, especially in the peri, 
uh, motor areas or around the speech areas when you are trying to uh, do tumor removal as you keep doing it patients may develop transient deficits in the this deficit in decision making you should be very very clear uh, uh, otherwise the decision on table may be different it can happen even in spine like uh, in ad when you are trying to reduce the ad and suddenly you see the loss of uh, uh, the waveforms there so what do you do so when you are trying to remove a premotor tumor and then suddenly again the uh, impulse waveform has come down what do you do you are not, not sure whether you have reached to the margin of the tumor or not so a lot of factors will play in role why the waveform has gone so before you make a complete decision as uh, dr nitin has shown in the flow chart we need to strictly follow those things if you are not going to follow the things in the flow chart you end up making a wrong decision like low to hypothermia or hypotension or lot of the surface is exposed and you can use simple warm saline to irrigate and see for the responses again try to correct for the hypotension try to see that the electrical circuits are uh, properly placed they try to see that there are no interferences electrical interference like all these factors needs to be checked before you take a decision initial cases when you are doing suddenly you find it a deficit we panic and you tend to stop or you modify your surgery and you don't do the other problem with that is uh, while ns is checking all these things we also feel that we are losing time i would have finished surgery by this time so when all such deficits happen you can move to other areas probably away from that area give some time for the brain to recover from whatever response whatever problem which has happened either because of traction or because of a uh, uh, lot of movement there so when you go to other area by the time say you take few minutes and then come back by the, and then check the response it may come back and from that moment you need to be extra gentle in that area a uh, simple example or i would like to quote is this maybe in acoustics when you are trying to operate uh i was see i was just checking at the chat one of the persons was asking uh, pro mg what is a criteria so when you are decompose adequately and when you keep reaching surface you can ask the anesthetist to start pro mg and you can look at when you are trying to do the pro mg whenever there is a stimulation happening you tell that indicates that you are nearby the nerve and that is a time when you uh it is adequately thinned out and you try to stimulate there to assess the distance as i told you 1 milliampere 1 millimeter so depending on the current you know how much thick the tumor is away from the nerve and you keep decompressing so these are some of the things where definitely i i am will teach us uh, uh to decide upon what step has to be taken next and uh, we'll stop at this we'll go back to nitin's uh, presentation where we have some case scenarios uh, we will be uh, showing the case scenarios and i'll try to emphasize on what uh, surgical steps or which uh, how to shorten or what, i'll give some tips in each case where you can uh, uh, speed and up your surgical procedure so nitin i'll uh, stop sharing okay. so that then we'll we can keep uh, yes. discussing thank you sir thank you for the you know uh, surgeon way of looking at ivnm so we'll we'll look at uh, some case series i think yeah yeah can i see my screen yes sir yeah okay so this is a thoracic uh, intramedullary tumor so what what would we do for this that is a question so probably scp mep was initially what we would do but now with the advance of uh, ad, uh, advent of uh, d wave 
D wave has changed the game. So D wave we put epidurally at the lower level of the incision, okay, and then continuously monitor for the D wave amplitudes, okay, with MEP and SSEP, and uh, we stop until the ampl uh, we continue until the amplitudes have uh, dropped by fifty percent. Okay, so that is what we do. D wave intramedullary tumor gold standard. Remember this. For this, you can keep a control as D wave on the proximal side. So if the proximal D wave is good and the distal D wave is dampened by more than 50%, that means definitely there is a uh, problem with the corticospinal tracts in the intramedullary tumor resection. So that is what uh, this is D wave with lower limb SSCP, uh, MEP with lower limb SSCP, and this is a epidural D wave catheter that we use in our center, surgically placed. This is a D wave. Nicely seen here, and we compare it with the baseline D wave and continuously monitor for the D wave. Sir, anything you want to tell us? You go back to the MRI image. Now, as a surgeon, when you see this kind of image, we are worried that uh, am I going to cause paraplegia? Okay. So, the monitoring definitely helps us here. When you do a laminectomy, uh, you expose the dura probably a little above the level of the tumor, a little below the level of the tumor. But uh, the, the point is when you try to incise, uh, the SSCP immediately goes off because you are going to incise in mid, probably midline if uh, you can fi find it out or probably the thinnest area possible. But most of the times it is a posterior column. So the SSCP immediately goes. So here we need to rely only on MEPs or D-Wave. Now MEP and D-Wave, Dr. Mithnes clearly told you uh, what are the advantages of D-Wave and uh, 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 MAP. D-Wave is now become gold standard. So what uh, we do is before you start uh, the surgery, you pass the D-Wave electrode subdurally or epidurally in the upper part. You pass it up and then you get a recording and that will be your baseline. So in principle, any surgical procedure, a baseline recording is mandatory. Now in your beginning cases, when you start surgeries, uh, uh, we tend to forget many things. One of the basic things is forgetting a baseline. So it's always mandatory in these cases, you do a baseline of whatever modalities you have. So here you first pass the D-Wave above, you have a baseline, then you pass the D-Wave below the lesion. Now, uh, in this particular case, we may not get a D-wave because the lesion seems to be going down till D10. Now, below D10, the amount of corticospinal fibers are less and uh, we may not get a D-wave, but uh, it's worth trying to get a D-wave and see. Definitely, what I predict in this particular case is the proximal to the lesion, you will have a good D-wave, but below the uh, the lesion, we may get a good D-wave or not, or we may not get a D-wave. So, and during surgery, as you try to remove tumor, the uh, once the cord gets thinned up, you keep uh, suction stimulators one of the best thing here, where you keep sucking out and then keep stimulating to see whether you're getting any responses uh, and parallel. And D-wave is one advantage that it will be a continuous thing and uh, any alteration D wave immediately you will be alerted. Kyphoscoliosis, I think this one, probably yeah. if you look into the history of uh, interop monitoring, it is the scoliosis is the one which is popularized monitoring. Apart from uh, epilepsy and uh, 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 movement disorder, scoliosis is the first thing which has popularized it. Those days uh, when there are a lot of problems with the technical things, the instrumentation, the uh, anesthesia, med medications and all. It was only SSCP which was used as a modality to help in correcting scoliosis. But now we know that SSCP talks about only posterior column. Now with advance in anesthetists, the technology, the anesthetic drugs and all, all the modalities are useful. So Kyphoscol is another surgery where it becomes mandatory. Nidhin, you want to talk anything yes, here? I think kyphoscoliosis, so what we do is we do um, uh, SACP and MEP, but more we are worried about MEP monitoring. 
so during the main thing is uh, we can do also pedicle screw testing when the screws are tested for nerve root uh, cortical medial cortical breach and once the rods are placed and the rod rotation is done so that is when the meps have to be checked frequently for every you know maybe 5 degree rotation we keep checking mep and then uh, once the meps have dropped then you stop the rotation and sometimes you have to undo your rotation also so very important in kyphoscoliosis uh, for intraoperative neuro monitoring i think uh, very good level 1 evidence to i think the society also says that without uh, monitoring you should not attempt kyphoscoliosis next uh, this is a peripheral nerve tumor sir so you can comment on this yeah this is uh, something which is uh, uh, very interesting in fact we got published it now unlike uh, uh, unlike other uh, uh, sorry one second i lost thing you are heard sir you can hear nicely yeah we, we can hear you i lost the image i don't know okay what happened so this is a sciatic nerve tumor sir so this was entering into the sciatic notch so generally for peripheral nerve tumors what we do is we stimulate proximally and record distally uh, from the muscles or we can do nerve action potential also but because this tumor was entering into the sciatic foramen we could not get a proximal segment to stimulate so what we did was we did a transcranial stimulation and we recorded uh, sciatic nerve distributed uh, mep and ssep uh, peripherally so i mean uh, so we could assess this by sciatic nerve integrity so this was one interesting case so this is what the proximal part we can't see because uh, it's in the foramen so this is a very very peculiar case sir. so here the monitoring strategies are different and uh, like nitin has told proximally you cannot see probably the mep's will help yes Now, sir uh, yeah just to come in sir uh, uh, i think you know we are short of time so okay. can you just go to only spine cases because i think you know the audience wanted to see some spine cases that's okay okay some vascular i had aneurysm and uh, whenever you do aneurysm temporary clipping time also you can gauge by doing bilateral eeg and ssep monitoring and you can actually tell how much clipping uh, temporary clip time you can apply for each case and uh, you can uh, remove the temporary clip so this is one thing so apart from this this is a case that was asked actually so i think uh, like uh, in the cath lab also like any abdominal aneurysms so very uh, challenging to do monitoring in uh, remote locations like in the cath lab here so you can see the wires the c arm i mean the uh, the arm that rotates and then the neuro intervention people uh, they are not used to doing without muscle relax and the cases so very challenging situation in the cath lab also uh spine uh, we can discuss on spine i didn't have much spine kept on the cases what what else spine you can ask so we can discuss that now if anything surgeon surgeon's perspective we can talk about tethered cord with the plug cord behind the image anything yes sir so yes yeah, sir you can talk sir once one plug cord uh, yeah. uh, case uh, lipomeningocele uh, like how do you do lipomeningomyelocele with uh, in the lumbar area uh, big one yeah in tethered cord uh, many a times uh, we can easily identify phylum terminal because it is taught the kind of vasculature uh, the cost to vessels on it we can easily identify the uh, phylum terminal and we can uh, uh, detether it but the problem comes when there is a plug cord sitting there now uh, uh, how much of the plug cord to remove that is a big problem Uh, without monitoring is extremely difficult to what degree uh, of plug cord excision you can do but with help of monitoring you can keep thinning it out uh, as much as possible slowly keep thinning you keep monitoring and thinning it it will tell how far away you are from the functional structures the neural structures and you can thin to the maximum extent the other area in uh, uh this uh, spinal dysphysism is when you have a lipoma down there i mean lipoma the lot of uh, fibrous strands which come within the tumor and it, sometimes it will be difficult to differentiate between nerve roots and these strands and that is where the monitoring really helps the other tumors like neurofibromas and paragangliomas ependymoma uh, it may not really help because most of the times the fibers are all displaced laterally and you can clearly identify 
but lipoma it becomes mandatory placode it becomes mandatory that you use monitoring okay sir uh, maybe in a cervical spine ad you can talk uh, how will you yeah. i think uh, i already just briefly spoke about that in ad uh, or cervical will you be worried about positioning also pardon will you be worried about positioning also yeah so that is what i was about to tell the most important thing is we try to do awake intubation and then uh, try to get some recording and then uh, uh, keep turn the patient prone and again check for the clinically functions whether is moving or not so positioning is very important many a times uh, uh, during positioning the person uh, that is why awake intubation is mandatory the second thing is uh, after positioning uh, once you open before you decompress or start decompressing the uh, it's mandatory to get a recording the reason being that during decompression you can tend to injure the spinal cord so before decompression mandatory you should have a recording and then compare it after this one so that will tell you at which phase of your surgery the damage has happened or if damage in ad especially may uh, you can clearly see when you try to reduce it many times if you are not doing it properly you can clearly see the waveforms slowly fading away and when you try to push it properly the waveforms will come back so definitely uh, going to be very useful in ad and the cervical canal Uh, okay, there is a question ask? from uh, one of the surgeons, sir. Yeah. Uh, how how useful I O N M uh, in cervical myelopathy, and like what are the you know I O N M modalities you might use for it, both of you? Uh, see, modalities again is simple. Right? It's always S S C P M E P D E wave. There's a, it's straightforward. There's no confusion in that. Now I leave it to the surgeons the uh, whether to use or not. But for beginners, it's mandatory. uh the reason being i'll tell you in the beginning stage you don't know the you may really not know the real technique of uh, doing a laminectomy and that is where the problem can happen you may not really know how the damage can happen during positioning so what i advise is when for a uh, surgeon is being is a beginner try to do awake intubation position check the neurological status then give anesthesia then do a, a, a map and sscp take baseline open now before decompression again you have to do once then decompress then check it so this will be a learning tool you will know where you are faulty and you will try to correct those things now for senior surgeons they have been routinely doing like uh, Uh, i don't i feel i don't require a monitoring for a routine cervical canal stenosis but for surgeon is in beginning of career probably this will very good to be yeah so one more uh, point is uh, even though the power is less than 3 by 5 so more than 3 by 5 you get good mep recordings so sometimes if the mep power is 3 by 5 or less you might be demotivated to do a mep you can think whether it will come or not so what i would suggest is get a baseline and check whatever you are getting so whatever recording or amplitudes you are getting during your baseline recording keep doing your surgery with the intention to preserve that and sometimes surprisingly what we have seen is with good decompression the amplitudes have increased also on table so yeah. it will show effective decompression also so this is one more important point that you need to keep in mind so one last case we will share sir this is our experience yeah. with there was a question on tether cord i think we triggered emg and uh, sphincters uh, obviously there's mandatory i mean that we need yeah. to... we have discussed that in our uh, this thing sir yeah. so last case is uh, vp uh, guided dbs one case which we have done and published uh, this is uh, for uh, severe dystonia where the target is uh, gpi and uh, because the patient was anesthetized and under anesthesia we had to do vp guided placement so we could uh, we would uh, we did it uh, by uh, uh, stimulating the dbs electrode and then recording for the uh, uh, visually or potential responses and uh, we place the position of the dbs electrode uh, at a distance of 1 mm away from the site where the maximal amplitude of vp responses are encountered without any corticospinal stimulation so we yeah, check side effects with the unique case uh, this is a very unique case normally most of the functional surgery is done awake 
Now this is a severe dystonia. Your patient is continuously moving, and uh, you can't even place the uh, frame, and then proceed with surgery. So anesthesia became mandatory. Now, when anesthesia became mandatory, we took the help of uh, intraop monitoring. Uh, in placing an electrode at GPI, one of the most important thing we look at is the uh, in an awake patient, we look at flashes of light when that is tells us how close you are from optic track. So this cannot be assessed in this particular patient because patient's anesthesia. So the next tool what we have is uh, uh, VEP. So VEP has helped us in this particular patient where uh, we place the electrode as per the uh, calculation from the uh, MRI and the packs uh, from the frame link. And then once we reached the depth, we did uh, VEP. Once we got the stimulation, we stimulated from here. Once we got the VEP, we know we are this many mm far away from the VEP and accordingly we place the lesions, uh, the, uh, the electrodes. So this is a very unique case. Okay, sir, I think we are done with cases. It's also time. So we'll give it over to Chaitanya. You can uh, show your equipment. And